Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me as always, this guy is either wrong or perfectly right every time. He is the captain. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling your mother. All right, today we are drinking bourbon barrel aged milk and cookies by the Crafty Brewers at Wicked Weed Brewing. Garage grade, four and a quarter bottle caps out of five. Captain, I decided to steal the comments from an untapped check-in from one of my untapped friends. Andrew says, bourbon barrel aged milk and cookies is sweet, smooth, dark chocolate, cookies, and slight bourbon taste. A real solid stout beer for sure. And Andrew... You are exactly right, my friend. And this week's beer was brought to us by these great friends right here. First up, we have Janessa in Lakeville, Massachusetts. A big shout out to Adrian from New Orleans. And next, we have Jenny sending hugs from Sweden. A big shout out to B from Denver, Colorado. This next one is from Jonathan, and he would like to hear the captain say his famous catchphrase show me the money he would like the captain to say chris hubber is a piece of shit well who is chris hubber do we know who chris hubber is i don't know how can i call this guy it might be jonathan's friend uh, well, or who knows well, that's not a Maybe nice thing to say really about your friend like. yeah hey chris hubber use a piece of shit all right our apologies to chris hubber yeah next well, up sorry we, about that we have susan in calgary canada and last but not least We have Iona in Belmont, California. Thanks to everybody for helping us out with this week's set of shows. If you want to give us some liquid encouragement for next week's shows, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on our donate button. It makes the catchphrases flow a little bit better. And that's enough of the business. Yep, everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. After the arrest of the beloved Dr. Vince Gilmer, people in the town were, needless to say, shocked. Many of them refused to believe it was even true. Some theorized that it was a mercy killing, that Vince knew his dad was beyond help and decided to put him out of his misery. Mm -hmm. But as pointed out on This American Life, Vince was a medical doctor. Wouldn't it be more likely that he would do so with pills rather than a violent strangulation severing the fingers and dumping the body. Well, and think about his patients as well. So many of his patients probably haven't seen him in a year. Mm -hmm. And to know him as this great doctor, then all of a sudden it's like, your doctor murdered his father. Yeah. I mean, it made no sense to anyone who knew and loved Vince Gilmer. Now, Vince was extradited to Virginia, where the body was found, from North Carolina to stand trial. Pretty quickly after Vince was arrested, he confessed to strangling his father. In his first court appearance for the first-degree murder charge, he told the judge that his brain wasn't working right. Right. But he was assessed by psychologists and deemed fit to stand trial. It was while Vince was sitting in jail in Washington County, Virginia, that Vince started writing a series of letters to the Bristol Herald courier newspaper based in Bristol, Virginia. This is around March of 2005. While Vince admitted that he had killed his father and mutilated the corpse, he said in these letters that the actual murder had taken place in Tennessee, not Virginia, that there was no reason he said for him to be in a Virginia jail at all. Mm. He had actually murdered his father in Carter County, Tennessee. He wrote Quote, I, Vince Gilmer, committed manslaughter on June 29th, 2004. It did not happen in Virginia. The only thing that happened in Virginia was the body ended up there. I am confessing it happened in Elizabethton, Tennessee. 
Now, Washington County, Virginia sheriff's detectives were dubious of these claims and said Vince's story had changed several times. Yeah, but he's also stating he's not in his right mind. Mm -hmm. Well, Vince says in one letter, quote, each time I tell the story, it is a little different. You can't include every detail every time you tell a story. A lot of it does not make sense, but that also shows it was not planned, end quote. It seemed that Vince was eager to prove that he hadn't planned the murder and whatever it was he had done, he preferred to be held accountable in Tennessee. But even after meeting with Vince and receiving a full confession in person, Tennessee authorities weren't able to confirm that any crime had taken place in their state. They only had Vince's word to go by. The letters Vince sent to the Herald Carrier gave a glimpse into what would be the basis of Vince Gilmer's defense at trial. Vince also gave several phone interviews with journalists from the paper, several in-person interviews and one TV interview from prison. And he told the following story that on the day before he killed his father, he Vince had stopped taking antidepressant Lexapro. Vince had decided, he said that he could do without the drug. This is a little strange given that Vince was a medical doctor and should have known how unsafe it was to stop taking these drugs so abruptly. Right. If Vince Gilmer went off Lexapro cold turkey, he definitely could have suffered adverse effects. Vince, Right, but would you really suffer them so quickly? You'd think that there'd be some lag time, like if you're taking the pill every 24 hours or so. Mm-hmm. Like that, if he just didn't take them one day, like it's not like, you know, he stopped taking them a few days before and now we're going to have the, the effects, those effects for the next couple of weeks could be pretty dramatic. Well, and that's what really calls a lot of this stuff into question. One, what would be the expected outcome of, of someone stopping taking these drugs so abruptly? Right. And then two they couldn't find any prescription for this stuff at all. So they, they had little proof that he's taking them out. That all, if right? he was actually even taking yeah. them now, Vince did say repeatedly to psychologists, uh, prison doctors, guards, and the media that his brain was not working right without Lexapro. In fact, he said in the wake of stopping, taking the drug, he didn't feel himself at all. Now these are his words. Okay. He said he felt mentally retarded. And reporters and others who met with him in prison noticed that Vince would make strange head movements and gestures. He would shake. He would become emotional and cry spontaneously. And you're saying that's not normal to do. Well, it's not perceived to be normal. Okay, well, I need to go see a therapist. <laughs> well, the, the other thing, though, too, because this is, this is going to become a key thing in this case, in this story, because... A lot of this behavior and what Vince could have been doing before or at the time of the murder will fall into his defense, right? Right. Because Vince stated in a TV interview, the one that we've been discussing from prison, that he was not someone who could hurt anyone. He denied flat out that he had intended to kill his father. Vince's letter stated that he killed his father in a fit of anger brought on by mental problems and years of resentment over childhood sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. He said, quote, I did not commit murder. The things that happened that night were beyond my control, end quote. What had actually happened that night, according to Vince's letters, and he details this in these letters, was this. Vince was driving his father in his truck, moving him to a closer nursing home with a plan to go kayaking along the way. But his father started taunting him during the 90 minute drive during which Vince stopped at an Arby's and a gas station. The taunting worsened. Vince wrote, quote, my father started sexually molesting me when I was six and my sister when she was three. Right. Mom tried to shelter us, but it kept on. He continued to try to molest us as adults. As they drove, Vince said, Dalton kept taunting, quote, he was always saying filthy, disgusting things to remind me of what happened. He reached over and tried to pull my head to his crotch. The voices took over from there. I started hearing voices telling me to kill people. 
The voices in my head were telling me to kill my father, end quote. Well, and to be clear about this too, Gilmer never said that his father was saying these things all the time. Like the, what he is claiming is that at some point his father molested him mm-hmm. for a series of years. Mm-hmm. Then, then it stopped. And then his dad didn't bring it up. Dad didn't talk about it. So now with his dad having some kind of dementia or whatever, they're now riding in the car and he's rubbing his son's leg and talking to him and harassing him about this time period. Mm -hmm. Almost, uh, you know, and almost acting as if his son, the doctor, is not 40 some years old or whatever he is at the time, but as, as if he's a child. Mm-hmm. And so as that, all that stuff is happening, you know, the doctor claims that I just snapped. Yeah. He says what, what happened next was a blur quote. Nothing made sense from then on. At some point he strangled his father and loaded his body into the back of the pickup. He waited until dark and then stopped at food city in Elizabethton to buy gloves and a tarp to cover the body in the truck bed. He stopped on a back road and decided to cut off Dalton's fingers and thumbs to try to hide the identity. He wrote, quote, I had a saw in my truck for sawing limbs in my yard. It took five minutes. Vince told investigators he put the fingers in a plastic bag and dropped them in a river. Mm. This, according to Carter County Sheriff Henson, who met with Vince in prison on March 16th. In this interview, Vince confessed to the murder on camera, denying vehemently that he had planned the whole thing. The sheriff and his deputies noted that Vince was acting very strange and that he was borderline incoherent, rambling, and couldn't complete a thought. And he was breathing hard, shuffling, and agitated. Vince told the men that he ended up in Washington County, where he had lived in the 1990s while studying as a resident at Bristol Regional medical center in Tennessee saying, quote, I decided to drop the body on the side of the road. My cover up of the crime was pitiful. If I had planned this, I would have had something to cover the body with. I covered the body. I didn't know where to go or what to do. I drove aimlessly. My brain was not working right. Right now he, he might've covered the body when it was in the truck bed, but when he dumped Dalton's lifeless body on the side of the road. Dalton wasn't covered by anything. He was, he was out there really for anybody to find, which was, as I stated in the first episode, I I thought was a little shocking in itself to make all of these moves and all these efforts to hide the identity of the victim that would ultimately be found on the side of the road when he could have taken additional efforts to conceal the body itself even further. Right. And I think a lot of, a lot of this story to me is when, you got this intelligent guy that for whatever reason snaps, but probably wouldn't have snapped normally. There's mm-hmm. something going on with him. He snaps. He, then he kills his father. And then he tells you, you know, I could have done this better. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I'm a smart guy. I could have covered him up better. The, my attempt to um, discard the body is, is a poor attempt. And that sounds sick. But I think he's trying to prove like, hey, I I could, I'm a doctor. I could have even done this better. Right. You guys are looking for proof of premeditated murder. I'm trying to provide you some proof that it was not premeditated. Right. And just the fact that he is a doctor and has, again, I think struggling with something, but with the idea that like he's saying, look, I'm smart enough to, to have taken some steps, but my brain's not working enough to let me take all the steps that I probably needed to take so that you couldn't ever find the body. Therefore you'd never be able to charge me. Yeah. Well, and obviously we're just picking apart pieces of the interview that we mentioned, right. As well as parts of the letters. But as far as the letters go, the, the Herald courier reporter sums up the article about the letters as a whole and gives this evaluation and published it on March 17, 2005, which read, The letters which skip over the details of how the father died 
tell a sometimes rambling story of mental illness, rage, and confusion. It's the latest twist in a case that investigators have called one of the most bizarre and gruesome in recent memory. I mean, it's definitely gruesome as far as... I just remember they kind of skimmed over the fact, you know, that he basically cut off every single finger. Right. I mean, that's, he, he skims over it, yeah. Yeah. He I said, mean, I decided to do this. I pulled over the side of the road. It took five minutes. But just, yeah, but even the... That's a gruesome five minutes. Mm-hmm. Well, let's talk about the flip side of the coin because we have Vince Gilmer who's saying, look, I, I was out of my mind. I was not in control. Um, the murder was not premeditated and happened as a result of all of these emerging factors, right? right. Voices in my head. Yep. The, the stop, I stopped taking this drug. Um, multiple things here. So the other side would be that a lot of people you know, said that it's pretty much evident from listening to the tapes of Vince, uh, Vince's prison conversation with, with friends and supporters that Vince wanted people to believe that there was something wrong with him, that there might not be something wrong that with he's him. acting. Yeah. Yeah. Vince even pointed out that the news camera footage that showed him being placed in a police car. Well, it showed him having this sort of head bob tick going on in that footage. Yeah. And he indicated to people around him that he had tremors that he could not explain. Now, law enforcement and prosecutors weren't buying it. They labeled Vince Gilmer as, quote, highly manipulative. They conducted an experiment where they set up video cameras to film the exercise yard in the prison. The cameras would catch Vince playing basketball or exercising normally. But when an officer of the court or a guard would step into the scene, Vince would start to shuffle, suffer from tics. Oh, faker. And act physically not in control of his body. Mm -hmm. And then a short time later, he would seem to return to normal. He starts playing like Air Jordan. Yeah. (laughs) He's in the back. He's he's like doing 360 dunks. And then every time they get around, he's twitching right he's he can't do anything so can we get to air jordan's trial yes so undeterred by vince's assertions that he hadn't committed a crime in their state washington county prosecutors proceeded with the murder trial based on the state law that permitted them to prosecute the case since the body was recovered in virginia vince gilmer went to trial on august 15th 2005 prosecutors painted Vince as a cold-blooded killer who planned the murder of his father. They pointed to the following circumstantial and other evidence. One, Vince confessed to killing his father. Two, he had done so in a brutal fashion, strangling him twice and cutting off his fingers. Three, Vince came prepared to commit murder with the saw and the rope already in his truck. Four, someone who helped Dalton into Vince's truck that fateful day actually heard Vince say, this is their testimony, heard Vince say to his father, quote, I've been waiting for this day for a long time. Some other information, Vince was overwhelmed by the amount of debt he was in. There was also no evidence to back up Vince's claims of abuse at the hands of his father. Furthermore, at trial, the prosecution presented tapes of conversations Vince had in prison which were quite damning in the conversations with his mother and friends. He appeared to be trying to manipulate the venue he would be prosecuted in, in order to get the most leniency. Remember the letters to the newspaper where Vince said he shouldn't be on trial in Virginia because he actually killed his father in Tennessee. Well, on the tapes, Vince says to his mother, a guy in here said Carter County, Tennessee is the best place to go. Right. To receive a shorter sentence. But he's also attacking people in prison. Mm-hmm. Well, and Virginia had the death penalty. Right. And in another phone call with a friend, Vince mentioned that he was trying to work out a deal with a DA in North Carolina. It sounded very much like Vince Gilmore was forum shopping and his his story changed accordingly to try to get this thing where he wanted it to go. Right. But the nail in Vince's coffin was hammered home by the fact that the clinical psychologist who 
had evaluated Vince to determine whether he was fit to stand trial, found him to be restless, agitated, and fidgety, but concluded that Vince was faking this. This was all a big fake, according to them. His, quote, symptoms, end quote, just didn't fit any known psychiatric disorder. He determined that Vince was sane. A psychiatrist who also examined Vince found him to be evasive, dramatic, and manipulative. The prosecution alleged that Vince had deliberately started acting bizarrely well prior to the murder as part of his long-term plan to fake insanity. That's a... But he's been doing this for over a year, or mm. close to a year. So you got to think that's that's some commitment. Yeah, well, it's it, you can commit yourself beforehand, or you can find yourself committed to prison for the rest of your life, mm. or possibly facing a death penalty. Yeah. Now in a very questionable judgment call, and I, and I, I say that with all honesty, the judge agreed to allow Vince to represent himself at his trial. Oh, this is great. Yeah. We never, we never liked this when pulled a Bundy, even when people seem to be behaving somewhat normally, he had a lawyer, Don Davidson, uh, present with whom he consulted from time to time, but Vince was the one up there questioning people in front of the jury. And by all accounts, it was a disaster. Yeah. Well, when you're attacking people in prison and you're constantly changing your story and you're constantly stating to people that there's something broken in your brain, that your brain's not working right. They shouldn't let you defend yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, you also have to wonder, is this also, Hey, an attempt that I can, put on a theatrical performance right in front of this jury. And maybe, maybe somehow we get this, uh, I've been deemed competent to stand trial. Maybe my actions or my theatrical presentation might change that opinion Mm -hmm. that, that now my insanity defense is a real actual defense. So I, I, to sum this up, um, and, and I'm going to use some other people's words to sum this up because I thought there was a lot of good um, um, play by play, so to speak, on the way that this went down. Vince was not able to keep his train of thought. This was very noticeable or effectively cross examine witnesses. He stumbled over words. He forgot what he was talking about and he rambled in a sort of stream of consciousness type of manner. Now, Davidson said that he could not string together a thought or ask a coherent question. And that watching it was like watching someone commit suicide with a butter knife. Mm -hmm. And Vince's defense was a very unorthodox one. Vince blamed the actions on serotonin or rather the lack thereof. Now, remember Vince is a medical doctor. He told anyone who would listen and many who wouldn't that he knew what he needed to fix his brain. And it was an SSRI medication. Vince told the jury that he suffered from withdrawal when he stopped taking his antidepressants and that voices in his head had repeatedly told him to kill his father. His brain, he emphasized again, was not working right. Listen up, this is big news because the 2019 FabFitFun Spring Box is now on sale. FabFitFun is a seasonal subscription box delivered four times a year with full-size beauty, fashion, home, fitness, and wellness products for just $49.99 a box. Every box is guaranteed to have over $200 in retail value. And the 2019 Spring Box has a total retail value of between $347 and $354.99. Treat yourself with such items as the Show Me Your Moo Moo robe, which has an $88 retail value, or the Unplugged Meditation Aromatherapy Diffuser, a $55 retail value. Let me tell you about these boxes. So the captain receives the winter box, and I received the spring box early. And yes, these products are mainly for women even though I did steal some of the the lotions that were in there. But I dropped these off 
at a family party and tell all the beautiful women in my family, go through these boxes, anything you want, please take home. And they freaked out. Yeah. They loved it. And they told me how great the products were and how fun this was. And they all signed up. So you need to sign up today as well. Sign up today at fadfitfun.com and start getting the box for a life well lived. But hurry, these boxes always sell out. Again, they always sell out. Use our promo code GARAGE to get $10 off your first box. That's GARAGE for $10 off your first box. That's over $200 of retail value for only $39.99. Go to fabfitfun.com and use our code GARAGE to get $10 off. That's fabfitfun.com and use promo code GARAGE. Take coloring your hair at home to the next level with Madison Reed. You'll want to check them out at their website at madison-reed.com because you deserve gorgeous professional hair color delivered to your door for less than $25. For decades, women had two options for coloring their hair, outdated at home hair color or the time and expense of the salon. Many Madison Reed clients comment how their new hair color has improved their lives. Women love the results. Gorgeous, shiny, multidimensional, healthy-looking hair. Madison Reed delivers gray-covering, game-changing color that you can do at home. And look as if you just came from the salon. What makes Madison Reed color unique is that it's crafted by master colorists who blend nuances of light, dark, cool, and warm to create 45 gorgeous, multitonal shades. You'll want to check out madison-reed.com. And we have our listeners who have emailed us and they say, I understand why you were talking about madison-reed.com because I am now a client and I'm loving it. My hair looks great. And you can check out their reviews as well. Find your perfect shade at madison-reed.com. True Crime Garage listeners get 10% off plus free shipping on their first color kit with code GARAGE. That's code GARAGE at madison-reed.com. You can treat yourself for under $25. Check out madison-reed.com today. Madison Reed, treat yourself. If there is something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals, BetterHelp Online Counseling can help. BetterHelp offers licensed professional counselors who specialize in issues such as depression, anxiety, relationships, trauma, anger, family conflicts, LGBT matters, grief, self-esteem, and more. Connect with your professional counselor in a safe and private online environment and get help at your own time and at your own pace. Anything you share is confidential and it's so convenient you can schedule secure video or phone sessions as well as chat and text with your therapist. If for some reason you're not happy with your counselor, you can request a new one at any time for no additional charge. Best of all, it's a truly affordable option. True Crime Garage listeners even get 10% off your first month with discount code GARAGE. So why not get started today? Go to betterhelp.com slash garage, then simply fill out a questionnaire to help them assess your needs and get matched with a counselor you'll love. That's betterhelp.com slash garage. And use our promo code GARAGE to get 10% off your first month. Check out betterhelp.com slash garage today. Cheers. This might be the closest I ever get to one of my dreams. Mm. And that would be to do the music for This American Life. Just one episode. I don't want paid. This is it would be a ultimate dream of mine. There you go. And I've 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 sent them a lot of messages and I've never never got a reply yet. Well, regarding this trial, Captain, I don't think that some of the best fiction authors out there could could script this thing. I mean, as, as the way that it sounds that it was going Stephen down. Stephen King could. Well, there you go. Uh, Vince's mother, Gloria, testified at the trial. And she states that Dalton, her husband, Dalton Gilmer, did have a history of mental problems. And he had violent outbursts towards her and the kids. But the prosecutors were able to show that there was really, there really wasn't any evidence of the violent sexual abuse alleged by Vince. Right. Although Vince's sister was alleged to have backed up the abuse story, she disappeared prior to the trial. So Vince wasn't able to produce any corroborating witnesses. 
And what witnesses he did call in the course of the trial were, frankly, irrelevant or even harmful to his cause. Gilmer's mental disorder argument backfired in court when his expert witness, his expert witness, claimed that his behavior sounded more like anxiety rather than a disorder. And Vince called his ex-girlfriend to the stand and asked her, quote, to the best of your knowledge, have I hurt anyone or killed anyone? To which she responded, your father. Right. Yeah. Well, the jury didn't buy Vince's insanity defense. Jurors noted that at times Vince seemed, quote, nuts, but other times he was totally normal. They believed he was faking. They convicted him of first-degree murder. The judge said at a post-trial hearing, quote, the defendant would go into an act. He would look up to see if the jury was buying it. When the jury wasn't buying it, he would go back to normal. It was clear that he was acting. Vince was sentenced to life in prison. And at the trial, the judge said the jury found you to be a cold-blooded killer. He says this directly to Vince Gilmer. Yeah, so that's where the story would end, basically. We have this guy that was a... He was a great guy. He was a great doctor. He was a great husband for a while. Mm -hmm. Then he has this car accident. Maybe that had some effect on him. Maybe it's, maybe he had some mental thing that was creeping up on him because a lot of those things, you know, uh, kind of rear, rear their ugly head over time and of age. Mm -hmm. Or maybe this trauma as a, as a child rears its ugly head. But either way, he kills his father. Now he's in jail. And that's kind of where the story would stop. Yep. Sent to prison for the rest of his life, a life sentence. But now you have this guy that if you heard him talk, he definitely sounds like there's something wrong with him. And then to find out that he's attacking, I, keep, I mean, I've said it five or six times during this show, he keeps attacking people in prison and now he's losing teeth because he's losing these fights. Mm -hmm. He is not a fighter. And... So then well, he, he is, he's just not a good Well, one. right, right. Yeah, he's a, he's a, <laughs> he's not he's, a winning fighter. He's definitely a fighter. Uh, but now you have this guy that took over his practice with the same last name. Yeah. And he's curious. Why are these people saying such good things about him? He knows what it takes, what kind of man it takes to what kind of man or woman, I guess, um, it takes to run this type of facility and then to hear what he did, it didn't line up to Ben Gilmer. Right. And so like, he starts asking some questions. Like any, you know, walk of life or any line of work or any career choice, you know, a lot of people can be doctors, but Dr. Ben Gilmer is hearing from previous patients and the staff that he works closely with that the former, that the, the previous doctor, Dr. Vince Gilmer, the murderer, was a good doctor. Right. was a great a good, doctor, a, a caring doctor. And a good man. Right. Yeah. So that's where this story takes a bit of a twist, because we've already talked about Dr. Ben reaching out to Dr. Vince, who's already in prison by this time. They start off with just trading some letters back and forth, then it goes to phone conversations, and then to meeting in person at the prison. Yeah. And through all of this correspondence... The entire time, Dr. Ben Gilmer is, he's wondering, look, th the appearance of this man, of Dr. Vince, the appearance of the prisoner, the, the, the letters that he's writing, the, the words that he's speaking, the interactions with him, it looks to Dr. Ben as this man is actually sick, that he, that, you know, regardless of you know, Ben, Dr. Ben knows that the authorities believe that Vince was manufacturing his symptoms. Right. But now Dr. Ben has to wonder what would be the incentive for Vince to continue to fake these symptoms six years into the life term right. by the time that they start interacting with each other. Right. So the trial's over. There's no reason to fake it. You're not putting on, who are you putting this fake show on for? This might be real. Right. And, and also he took an oath. So... What's the worst thing that can happen? You test it, right? Yeah, let's let's give him a test, and if we get and if we, if we take the simple test, we might be able to figure out what's wrong with him, if there's anything wrong with him. So basically, what happens is we have Doctor Ben. He decides that it's likely 
that Vince Gilmer was actually sick. And he was determined to get to the bottom of it. So he's going, but he doesn't know what the, what the affliction is. He doesn't know what's wrong with Vince Gilmer. Right. So he returns to the prison in the company of an experienced psychiatrist. And the two of them met with Vince so that the psychiatrist could observe Vince for himself. After the meeting, the two doctors, they leave the prison. They talk, they're talking. They're trying to come up with theories as to what could be wrong with Vince. Yeah. And the psychiatrist actually didn't think that it was the SSRI withdrawal. He didn't think that that, that, that would explain what he was seeing. Right. He also didn't. It might explain some of the symptoms, but not all of them. He also didn't even think that it was the head injury either. And they just kind of kept coming up empty in the beginning. And then eventually the psychiatrist says, you know, could he have, could Vince have Huntington's disease? To which Dr. Ben thought to himself that this fits, this might fit. It's very rare. So Dr. Ben was desperate to get Vince tested for Huntington's disease. The test is a simple blood test. And luckily these tests for Huntington's for the gene are 100% accurate. There is virtually no chance for error. Uh, He was unsure how to proceed until three weeks later when he discovered that Vince had been moved to a psychiatric hospital after threatening to commit suicide with a razor blade that was found in his cell. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ben met with a social worker at the hospital and suggested that they test Vince for Huntington's, and they did. And Dr. Ben was not surprised to learn that the test was positive. Vince had 43 repeat markers for Huntington's disease. So what is Huntington disease? All right. Here's what I was able to find. It is. And you're no doctor. That's right. That's right. It is a hereditary neurological disease in which the carrier's neurological condition deteriorates over time, specifically according to the Mayo Clinic The disease causes the progressive degeneration of nerve cells in the brain. Eventually, it leads to loss of bodily and cognitive control and then death. It has been described as a cruel combination of ALS, Parkinson's, and Alzheimer's. Typically, there are no symptoms until age 30 or 40, and then the severity of the cognitive and behavioral symptoms depends on the number of genetic markers for the disease the sufferer has. One of the common symptoms of the disease is a loss of control of the muscular system, resulting in dance-like tics. Also common are muscular rigidity, slow or abnormal eye movements, impaired balance, and difficulty speaking or swallowing. But other symptoms include Cognitive deterioration, personality changes, impulsive mood swings, irritability, aggression, and even psychological symptoms typical, typically associated with schizophrenia right, or so, psychosis. So he knew there was something wrong. He just didn't know exactly what it was. Yes. Yes. And, and look, I mean, when we rattle off all of those symptoms and all of what could be going on with one individual that you're observing... That's a lot of different things here that could be going on, which could could be very difficult for even a very good doctor to pinpoint the actual disease or pinpoint what is actually going on with that person just based off of visually seeing them. And mind you, a lot of these uh, interactions are probably taking place on the other side of prison bars or at least glass. Right. It is very often misdiagnosed, apparently, um, because the significant aspect of Huntington's is that it causes psychiatric disorders like depression, mania, bipolar disorder, and can actually vary widely in the symptoms exhibited by different patients. Yeah, I would assume that this is misdiagnosed a lot as bipolar or schizophrenia. Yes, and notably, Huntington's patients are noted often to clash with law enforcement, and this because of their uncontrollable impulsive actions or even drunken appearance or their movements appear to be that of a drunken person when when really they're not, obviously. Right. Um, This is a difficult thing here, Captain, because 
really what all this may suggest is that we have we definitely have this doctor, Dr. Ben Gilmer, who's trying to find out what happened to Dr. Vince Gilmer. Mm -hmm. How did he go from being a caring, loving doctor to to murdering his father? I don't think it's that complex. He has Huntington's disease. And when you have that. Yeah, but so so that last bit of information that, that, that I threw out there in regards to what I could find online about Huntington's disease, the, the portion of the of where it says Huntington's patients are noted to often clash with law enforcement. Look, I, I think that's a, that's a difficult thing to really state and say it that way. You know, that's not my information. That's me passing along some information that I found. Right. And I don't know that the answer here is just simply that he has Huntington's disease and that's why he killed his father. That it, doesn't, that it's doesn't a part of it. It's a percentage of it. Right. I think that that could be a part of it. But and I remember when they covered this on This American Life, that at some point, I believe it was Sarah Koenig, she offered a uh, maybe somewhat of an apology because I, I think some people came after the show in regards to how they may have represented or misrepresented people that are afflicted with Huntington's disease. Right. And I think that my take from hearing their show was not so much that they are pointing towards Huntington's disease as being the cause of this murder. No. I think really what this story tells me, and keep in mind, this is not, everybody's got to keep bear this in mind when, when they listen to this show or, or to other shows, this American life didn't write this story. They didn't, this isn't some fictitious story that they came up with. This is living, it's breathing people. This is real life. That's why it's called true crime garage, not a fictitious crime garage. They are simply reporting and right. telling the story of something that actually happened that involved a bunch of other people. And really what you have here is one doctor's dedication, Dr. Ben Gilmer, one doctor's dedication to determine what was wrong. What is wrong with the man that I see before me now, six years after the murder? Right. What is wrong with this individual that I'm interacting now with now? Not necessarily what was wrong with him at the time. It might bring to, it might help bring some of that to light or give some uh, suggestion as to what could have been going on with this individual before he murdered his father. But it's simply a doctor looking at a man in a prison and viewing him as a possible patient, as a patient, as somebody that he should try to take care of. And that's what they came. The conclusion was that this man absolutely did have Huntington's disease. Yeah. So I think that with this situation, first we have Dr. Ben Gilmer trying to look into this and see what was going on. He wants to know why, just like we started off the show saying that, Often when we look at a murderer after the fact, after we know that they're guilty, after we know that they 100% did it, we still want to know why right. he wanted to know why I think in this situation, the Huntington's disease and, and God bless Dr. Ben Gilmer for, for do this was a lot of stuff he didn't have to do yeah, but, a, a lot of effort that he didn't have to do. Let's, let's be honest though. The chances are if his last name's not Gilmer, just like Vince Gilmer, it, the story stops with, oh, the other guy kind of, you know, went off the deep end and killed his father. Okay, cool. Moving on. You know, but the fact that it was taken over a practice and you have the same name and there's similarities, that that's kind of what drove the, that extra mile to mm -hmm. get to that answer, mm -hmm. you know, where I think, and but good, because again, maybe it's just a percentage uh, of the reason of why this murder took place. But like the big difference when you, especially if you listen to that episode is when you hear him talk the first time, Vince Gilmer, and then you hear him talk after they put him on medicine and it's like a different person mm -hmm. and he's not now attacking people and getting into to fights that he can't even, he shouldn't be getting into. Mm -hmm. Um, he's almost became a different person immediately within a couple of days of being medicated. Right. And I mean, you can sit there and say all you want 
that oh well, he could have been could have been faking it that maybe 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 there was some faking you, going on but right, it doesn't but matter we you know can't you can't fake, fake that we the know 100 percent yeah. that the, yeah according to the blood test you can't fake a blood test so, so I don't know that Dr. Ben Gilmer got his answer as to why, but then we're tasked with looking back on this story and all the information we know and wondering, still wondering why. And I think that for me, I I keep going back to the whole thing of was this actually premeditated or was it spur of the moment? I think that you can have all these factors go into why Dr. Vince Gilmer committed this murder and it still be premeditated, I think. But then on the other side of the fence, you could have all these factors that went into it and it not be premeditated at all. I do find it strange that they went way out of their way to this quote unquote kayaking trip. That seems very weird to me. I wouldn't discredit. I wouldn't take away from the fact that we know that he likely had a severe head injury. I think that the I think that's a percentage of this all too. I I agree. And and I, you know, we made a little light of it yesterday, but you know, you asked me, have I seen or witnessed people throughout the history of the course of my life people behave sometimes dramatically different after a head injury? And the sad truth is yes, and often it's not it's not, you know, someone is a good person and becomes a better person it's usually it's some strange things that i wouldn't have thought about the person before the head injury if that makes any sense yeah i had had a student that he came to me after a head injury Uh, he wanted to learn how to play guitar he was in his 60s and he didn't seem normal 60 year old he almost acted like a Almost acted like an eight year old or a ten year old, mm-hmm. but real nice, real polite. And his and his girlfriend, God bless her, she said, "Look, he we were dating for just a little bit. He had an accident at work. He basically acts like a little kid now. Um, and but you know he's nice. He means well. And and so I didn't know him before, but I definitely saw the effects of it afterwards. Mm-hmm. And I know of at least one of individual that I thought that I knew." very well for a long period of time that, um, you know, didn't ever get into much trouble. If it was, it was all, you know, small time stuff, normal teenager type stuff. And this person at some point suffered a head injury, maybe more than one. And later in life exhibited violent behaviors that I never thought they were capable of. Yeah. I mean, I I think, whether it's premeditated or not, that that doesn't really matter too much to me, because I th- like I said, I think it's a combination of having this disease, this head in- injury, a lot of factors. The fact that you know, if if the allegations of molestation are true, uh, you know, that's a factor as well. And then this crime takes place, um, but it's great to see that somebody cares and goes the extra mile to say, hey especially with mental illness, because it's just something that we're not talking. We just don't talk about enough in this country. And it's Mm -hmm. like so taboo. And it's like the amount of emails that I still get for saying, Oh, it's so great that you talked about depression. We all should be talking about it. Everybody faces depression at some point. And the fact that, um, that this is another thing by talking about, this disease that somebody can go, Hey, my, my uncle's acting a little strange. Hey, maybe we can test him for this. And, and I think it just opens up the gateways uh, of communication. Yeah. And to be perfectly clear here, I mean, yes, we pointed out that that Dr. Vince Gilmer at the time that he murdered his father, he was at the age where the symptoms of Huntington's are usually just starting to really set in. And in the year before the crime, he exhibited the changes in behavior that we discussed, including anxiety and other psychological symptoms. He suffered a significant head injury. But to be very clear, Huntington's does not typically cause people to become violent. Okay. And same thing goes with head injuries. Does not typically cause people to become violent. We are simply looking at a very specific story. 
of, of, a, of a man who killed his father and asking the question of why. Right, but each individual is going to be affected differently by a disease, and each individual is going to be affected differently by a head injury. Mm-hmm. Um, Vince Gilmer has since started to take SSRI medication, Celexa, to help stabilize his brain, and the results have been dramatic, as pointed out by the captain. As noted by Ben Gilmer, Vince is now able to conduct a normal conversation, and his symptoms have eased. But sadly, the only treatment for Huntington's is symptomatic. There is no cure, and eventually the disease will overtake Vince and end his life. Now, Ben Gilmore and other advocates for Vince, including his attorney, Don Davidson, and the Virginia Innocence Project, are pushing for Vince to receive a conditional release from prison and be placed in a mental health facility to receive the care he needs. Vince's diagnosis certainly calls into question the constitutionality of allowing him to represent himself at trial. And, of course, it calls into question whether Vince Gilmer was in his right mind when he killed his father and cut off his fingers. Whatever struggles you are facing from depression, anxiety, to trauma and grief, BetterHelp can connect you with a professional counselor in a safe and private online environment. It's so convenient, you can schedule secure video or phone sessions, as well as chat and text with your therapist. And anything that you share is completely confidential. Best of all, it's a truly affordable option. True Crime Garage listeners even get 10% off your first month with discount code GARAGE. So why not get started today? Simply go to BetterHelp.com garage and fill out a questionnaire to get matched with the counselor you'll love today. That's betterhelp.com slash garage. And here's a little recommendation before we leave you this week. You'll want to check out HBO's new docu-series, The Case Against Adnan Syed. And while you're at it, check out our show Off the Record, available on Stitcher Premium, where we have been discussing the case against Adnan Syed. Yeah, so every Sunday a new episode comes out. We've covered part one and part two. Uh, So next week, after we watch part three on Sunday, on Monday, we'll talk about part three. So check it out. You can kind of watch the documentary with the captain and the colonel. And if you want to sign up for Stitcher Premium, just go to our website, truecrimegarage.com, to start listening today. All right. Until next week. Everybody, be good, be kind, and don't litter.